And a very good afternoon on behalf of everybody associated with the National Atmospheric Deposition Program and the Central Analytical Laboratory. Thank you for joining us on our continuing series of webinars entitled, Where Does My Sample Go? I guess first and foremost, before we get started today, uh, I'd like to wish everybody a happy 2015. Uh, this is our first webinar of 2015. Oh, everybody had a tremendous holiday season. Old man winter was uh, tough and uh, here in central Illinois today, uh, 60 degrees, a little snow on the ground, but it looks like spring is right around the corner. Uh, in today's webinar, uh, the moderator, as usual, is Brian Kirshner. He's Assistant D Database Manager, and I'll be joined by my side, uh, Director of the Central Analytical Laboratory, Chris Lehman. If this is your first opportunity to join us for one of our webinars, we're an impromptu bunch. Uh, if at any time throughout this you have questions regarding, you know, want to stop in the middle about something we said, and you want to ask a question, you can uh, select it uh, down the lower left-hand corner of your screen. You'll say, send it to everyone as you type in your question, or you can just uh, default and uh, send it to the presenters, which will be us, and we'll answer it to everyone. Uh, we'll repeat the question as it goes, as we go along, so everybody can know what was asked and what was answered and uh, elaborate as best we can. Next slide there, sir. I introduced, oh, I'm Jeffrey Pribble, by the way. <laughs> that's, if you haven't seen me before, I, that's who I am. And as you're going along, you can also download the, the presentation that we're giving. Uh, it's there at the link that Brian has just put up, goillinois.edu forward slash NADP training. There's a PDF file you'll find. Uh, Brian's also recording this. Uh, this will be posted for archive purposes online. So if you're training someone, they can view this. Uh, the purpose of this webinar is this was one of our more popular topics when we would do on-site training courses here at the University of Illinois. And so in, since we can't bring you to the lab, we're bringing the lab to you. So we'll be going through the processes to prepare the supplies to go out to you, the sample receiving, and then showing you pictures of some of our staff and analytical facilities that we use to uh, analyze your samples. And as Jeffrey's already noted, feel free to ask questions. This is meant to be interactive uh, and really to be informative to you. So don't hesitate to ask questions through the presentation. Also, as you get into the goillinois.edu and ADP training, you can archive some of our past webinars. If there's a specific topic that you'd be interested in, you can go back uh, to 2013, the ones we did in 2014, and this one as well. So feel free to uh, view those as well. And any comments that you may have uh, at the end, you'll see the email address or the 800 number that you can contact us uh, if there's questions. So let's get started. Thanks once again to everybody for taking time out of your day and joining us. And uh, to my moderator, Brian Kirshner, and my sidekick, Chris Lehman. Where does my sample go? Well, if you see the picture to the right, and the box to the left, the sample comes off of the collector, goes into a little sample box, and away we go. Two collectors that we still have in the network, uh, the AeroChem becoming more popular are the Incon collectors. The one to the left is a two bucket collector operated with a grid sensor. Two buckets, one side being on the left is the dry side. The one on the right is the wet side, the sample bucket for the Incon. It's a one bucket collector, uh, an optical sensor, a these optical sensor, uh, very more uh, sensitive to the uh, in, uh, elements of the environment, whether it be dirt, dust, bugs, uh, or light precipitation. It's, uh, the optical sensor allows that to pick it up much easier. Next slide, please. We're gonna bypass all the uh, processing of the decanting of the sample, the looking at it we anticipate and that that has been a past uh, webinar to where you go about and we give instructions and like i said you can view that as well uh, but as you process your sample we're going to give you the end result uh, this is a sample that is ready for shipping keynote here see the field form is wrapped on the outside of the bottle bag uh, make sure that when you're getting your sample ready to go that you have the barcode label in the upper left-hand corner of that field form and your barcode on that bottle bag as well. Wrap it up on the outside. Make sure your lid is real tight. Uh, we are still experiencing a few issues with the uh, leaking 
of the bottles. So the best you can protect the field form, the better, uh, because when it leaks, it has a tendency to sometimes smear it and become a little illegible. So we try to protect it as best we can. Next slide, please. We got her all ready to go. We got the pre-made boxes uh, that we send to you with your big boxes of uh, supplies. Got it all ready to go. The appeal form on the outside again. Next slide, please. The finished product is uh, make sure the labels uh, where you're shipping it is nice and clear uh, with the different delivery systems that we have, which I'll address in a minute. Sometimes these labels get covered up. Uh, you're sent the cow address labels as well as sticky labels, not to mention the pre-printed side of the box uh, here. So uh, make sure that those are legible and clear. Uh, don't cause any delays in our shipping. The way we ship, uh, we use the United States Postal Service. We use uh, two different types of Federal Express. Uh, only a couple sites use FedEx Ground. Most of them uh, use the regular FedEx and, of course, uh, UPS. Um, sites, depending upon the contracts, have a variation as to how they go about uh, shipping stuff to us. Some are UPS, some are the Postal Service. I know contractually speaking, and Chris can elaborate on this a little bit more, that I believe USGS has a contractual obligation with Federal Express for shipping uh, samples to and from us, and you get the prorated information and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, cut a little cost. Yeah, just a note is uh, part of the cost structure of NADP is we pay to return supplies, clean supplies to you, but you and the funding agency or operating agency of your site are obligated to pay the return shipping of used supplies and samples. And as Jeff alluded to, uh, various federal agencies have preferred contracts with either FedEx or UPS or even the U.S. Mail. And so use your preferred contract shipper. Um, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to contact us if you have any questions or concerns about returning your sample. But basically, your operating agency will specify the, the best means and most cost-effective means to get samples to us. Just a note, um, supplies, especially used supplies, can take the lowest and cheapest way to get back to us. Those are fine. Um, samples, uh, standard post, first-class mail, or equivalent is acceptable, so is UPS ground. Um, there really is no need to pay for supplemental next day shipping unless um, some government contract have that stipulated as part of their cost structure. And again, uh, this is really case by case basis. If you have any questions or concerns, just feel free to contact us. Here's one little hint too. Uh, for those sites that do get the pre-printed labels from your uh, sponsoring agency, uh, if you do run low on those particular labels, if you can get some non-pre-printed ones from your uh, driver or whatever, uh, you can go ahead and use those, uh, the important information you can get off of the pre-printed one. And we're talking about the account number and everything like that. So if you have a blank one, uh, fill it out accordingly until you can get those, uh, again, from your sponsoring agency. And that's both for Federal Express and for UPS. At the University of Illinois, we have a contract with UPS. So primarily all the stuff that we ship back to uh operators uh, and to sites it goes through UPS. Uh, there is a uh, surcharge to in through the university account. So uh, that's a chosen carrier for us. Next slide, please. And you can tell that this, well, this possibly could have occurred today because the temperatures are up enough, but uh, there's leaves on the trees. So I, I guess that's a dead giveaway, but uh, we get daily shipments uh, daily from FedEx, United States Postal Service, and UPS, they bring the big boxes as well as the samples. You see the, the big boxes of the used supplies on the left and the samples on the right, a uh, variation of the our Airmon, or Amon network, uh, the Airmon samples and the NTN samples. Uh, hint for what's on left, and I'll repeat myself again, is uh, when you get a full box of six used supplies, uh, we're talking about buckets and lids. Please uh, ship them back to us uh, as quickly as you can. There's no urgency to it. Uh, we'll replenish your supplies and get them back to you. That way we can maintain a consistent inventory. Sample is in. It's opened up by one of our uh, chief clerk in back. 
uh, as they open up the samples, they check out the field form. It's given a sample number. It uh, goes through every section of the field form, making notes, uh, checking out the leakage of the sample. Um, if there's uh, damage to the box, so to speak, that may have caused leakage, uh, lid issue, whatever it may be. But that's the first step as it comes to the door is the opening of the sample box. You see the samples there to the left as they're unpacked from the boxes. They're uh, stacked up on a cart there. Uh, normally, we stand behind a, a system that's been, since I've been around here, and I've been around here a long time, that what comes in the door uh, generally gets processed that same day. And we uh, we hold proud to that as an organization that uh, what comes in our door, we process and try to get back out the same day. The field form, uh, a lot of variables and uh, things, information on the field form. Uh, we highlight a couple of areas uh, for the field bucket. Uh, thing to note, and with the uh, implementation of the e-gauges, uh, downloading data and stuff like that, it's not as easy as a Belfort chart where you take off the chart. Uh, thing to note is when you take a sample off, and for example, uh, you know, I took this sample off on the 7th of May at 9 o'clock. When I fill out my next field form, my on time is going to be the 7th of May at 9 o'clock. Um, if you, and we get, we run into a lot of this where an operator will write down that they uh, put it on it, you know, on the 7th of May, uh, but they put it on at 8 o'clock. Well, you took one off at 9, you don't put the next one on at 8 o'clock. If for some reason you are doing site maintenance, and you take your sample off at say nine o'clock, but you don't get your next one on till say 10 o'clock, make a description back down there in a remarks section, section 10 of your field form describing what sort of site maintenance that you did uh, to cause the gap in, in the data or in the uh, samples being taken off and the next one put on because uh, we make note of all those time gaps and overlaps and stuff like that. The next section is the bucket sample weight section. Even if you have a dry sample where you go a whole week where you did not have any precipitation, we still ask that the bucket you take off the collector and the lid that you were supplied with your sample, that you weigh those. We do a comparison between your scale and our scale to make sure that, you know, that we're both on the same page. If we have a big uh, variation, say, you know, your scale may weigh 100 grams. We know it didn't rain, but you got 100 grams of sample and we weigh zero according to the buckets. We have an issue, we ask operators on a timely fashion, two once in a blue moon, uh, do the, uh, what's the word I'm searching for here, a, a check of their scales. Uh, check the scales on an annual basis, make sure that they're zeroed out and uh, cleaned and are accurate in their weighing of the bucket and lid and sample to give us an accurate total volume. Next one, please. Any questions to this point? Let's stop for a second and see if we have any questions that anybody would like to ask or comments to be made. I'll give you a second before I proceed. Since there are no questions at this time, we'll proceed. Sample entry, this slide here, is our data entry program designed by our, uh, this uh, slide here, uh, this program is our data entry program designed by our database manager, Tom Bergerhouse. This is a tremendous uh, system and I'm I'm old school. I used, I came from the paper trail days and I, I was bucking and kicking when this was implemented. I'm gonna tell you what, this tells you absolutely positively everything you want to know about your particular sample. If you see in the upper left-hand corner, you see the sample number. For example, this one is TN2447SW. This is sequential, so it goes on, 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 and uh, that's how we uh, we give the sample numbers to the particular samples that come in. It's all the information. It's basically a view of the way we enter our data is off of your field form. So if you've left something blank, then we'll send an email to you uh, asking you to give us the information. The information you see over to the right uh, gives us some information uh, where it says the electronic gauge summary. It tells you about the what you've downloaded off of your e-gauge, uh, number of cycles, wet, dry exposure. 
you want me to elaborate on that information, uh, feel free to email or call the 800 number. I'm going to ask Chris to explain what's above that uh, for the sample chemistry. Oh, and a lot of this Jeffrey's showing, I realize this is uh, an internal screenshot of what we see, but in coming years, uh, ongoing discussions and planning, we're going to make more of this available to you. So we're planning um, interactive websites where you can see more of what we see when we check samples. Uh, Jeffrey noted that we can look at chemistry. It tells us about ion balances. It's things that we'll get to later in the presentation. But this is just a preview of um, information we'll be rolling out hopefully over this coming year where we're giving you uh, as quickly as we can feedback on uh, presentations that, that we provide. Let's go on. And then this is a screenshot of what you currently see. Um, it's the NTN sample report that's issued right after we log information in the laboratory. Um, it provides information about that you've reported on the field form and conditions you've noted. There's a series of automated checks that are made that would show alerts at the bottom, and that's things that Jeffrey noted on the previous screen. We see one view, and then pertinent information we provide to you for you to respond to uh, to immediately address issues. And it's really worked well. Um, the reports go to the primary operator at the field site, um, whether or not they were the ones that submit the sample. But the primary site operator is usually the one that's noted to uh, primarily deal with, with first level of site issues, unless there's a note that we should follow up with someone else. This is a report that you get with each individual sample. And I, I, I'm just going to, we should have, I should have waited for the next slide. <laughs> this is a, Example from our Bonville station, Illinois 11. It's what we operate here at the University of Illinois. And this is the uh, summer report you receive each month. We've transitioned to this over the last year. Uh, those of you who've been with the program a long time, we've come a long way with old hard copy reports. Um, and this is really in response to feedback we've been given. So uh, our best ideas have come from field site operators such as yourself. So if you find something confusing, um, we do listen to all your feedback and adapt the reports uh, appropriately. There's two bits of information here highlighted. Uh, first of all, this is just the sample dates and times and the preliminary chemistry that we receive. But the red box at the top notes some validation notes codes and quality ratings codes. And that's something that the program as a whole has moved to uh, to give you some idea of the quality of the final data. A quality data, that is data with a quality rating of A, generally has no uh, notable issues. B quality data has some minor issues. And C quality data um, is data that's determined to be invalid for one or more reasons. Um, in just a minute, we'll go to the next slide. And just other thing I want to highlight is at the bottom of the page, there's another red box that shows um, just a count year to date of the number of samples in the A, B, and C class. Keeping in mind again that A and B data are considered valid, C data are invalidated for one or more reasons. Uh, let's go to the next slide, Brian. I believe we have, yes. Uh, you receive this as a separate attachment. Um, when you receive the emails, you essentially get zipped together a file that has all the sample receipt reports that you would have received as a reference um, when samples were noted in the lab. And those are, are really done in real time as we're receiving samples. It also contains the monthly data summary with the preliminary chemistry. And then uh, the flags I just talked about, the notes flags and quality rating codes are defined in a separate attachment. So I'm not gonna go through each of these unless there's a question, but the notes are listed alphabetically down the left-hand column. The meaning of them is the descriptions in the middle column and the right is the quality rating code of the resulting data. Um, any particular ones you wanna highlight? One that comes in often during holiday periods would be the E code. Um, NADP stipulates that the NTN samples duration be no more than eight days and two hours. And so we often have extended sampling, like two week sampling. So that's a common problem we see around the holidays. Can we go back one slide? I wanted to point out something real quick, if we could, to the operators. Down in the, when you get your monthly report, down in the lower part of this, 
there's a uh, section called site equipment that tells you about the primary rain gauge, backup rain gauge, collector, site, power, and other. If at any point in time uh, you ever have any changes uh, to your site equipment or anything like that, please make note of it because that is on the bottom of every uh, field form. I know that most changes are made with the approval of the network uh, to your site and stuff like that, but I want everybody to be aware of, of that section as well. And then just one other note, twice a year you would have received, I think it was in January, um, we send out what we call a personnel report that lists everyone per our records at your site, um, who is receiving data reports, what their contact information is. Uh, we typically send those out in January and June. Um, you know, that's who is getting your reports and these go out electronically. So if more people would have use for this data, feel, don't hesitate to let us know. We'd be happy to uh, send these reports to additional people. They're sent electronically, so that's really no problem at, at, for our, on our end. Reason sample can be invalidated. Uh, number of reasons, pouring leakage from the bag back into the bucket. Uh, pouring water from the dry side into the sample. If you have precipitation in your dry side and you want to measure it at some capacity uh, by taking that particular bucket in or decanting it in something, make sure that it is not uh, involved with the wet bucket at all. Uh, what we get a lot of times are operators that are in the snow belt, uh, in the Wyomings, the mains and stuff like that, that are using the AeroChem collectors where they'll get some snow in the dry, but not necessarily uh, moisture in their wet bucket. The uh, triggering of the AeroChem uh, is affected by the grid sensor, where the optical sensor is a lot more sensitive. So operators will want to know uh, the moisture content of what you're getting as far as the precipitation can affect your collection efficiency, where it will affect the sample not being within the 5%. Uh, if you want to take that amount and measure it, let it melt at room temperature. Don't put it next to a heater or anything like that. We want it to melt naturally. And the same goes for your wet sample is to let it uh, melt naturally, weigh it, and maybe make note in section 10 on your fuel form that you had this much precipitation in your dry bucket. Once again, make note, please do not introduce this to the wet sample in any capacity. Uh, number three, grossly contaminated samples. We talk about bird droppings. Uh, one thing that we try to point out when you inspect your bucket for the first time to make note of what you see in there because after the travel uh, to and from the site, uh, the you know stirring and mixing and the bumps and everything that may cause that sample to break down, what you saw in there initially may not be there when you get back to the sample because it may have broken down. So please make note of that initially. As Chris said, uh, during the holiday season and the uh, E on the uh, on the coating uh, samples greater than 194 hours. If you know you're going to be away, uh, your backup operator will not do it. Uh, you know, we try to get back on the seven day schedule. If you got to go to a Wednesday to Wednesday, a Monday to Monday, however you got to do it to get, stay within the 194 hour uh, spectrum, go ahead and make a note, uh, call us, let us know that's what you're up to or email us as well. Uh, ball samples, no power to the collector. If you're running on solar power, you have power issues, whatever it may be. We ask that you go to bulk samples. At least we're collecting something. If you have a power issue and you don't address it and the sample collector stays closed, then we don't collect any sample. We would rather have a sample of bulk than nothing at all. Undefined samples, excessive dry deposition, once again, goes to uh, equipment issues. Uh, you know, if we're having a problem with the sensor in the motor box. Uh, you've got a collector that stayed open and there hasn't been any precipitation. That can be one of the codes that invalidates the samples. Uh, not letting sample thaw completely room temperature. I address that. Uh, don't put it next to a heater. We've actually had operators that, uh, you know, put it next to a heater and melted the bucket. So reusing unclean buckets. Once you use your bucket, put it in your used material box and get it ready to ship back to cow to get it replenished. If you have a bad dry side bucket uh, that you want to replace and you want to take a bucket out of your used supplies and make it your new dry side bucket, uh, you'll be shipping back five instead of six. Please make a note on when you ship in your big box that you've used one for your dry side. 
what I would like you to do before you put that on your dry side is to take a magic marker and write dry side only on it. That way it doesn't get mixed up with the current used uh, buckets that you're going to uh, ship back to Cal. Um, and number nine, field handling error. If you, you know, accidentally drop a lid or if you actually touch the inside of the bucket, uh, with the amount of chemistry we do, uh, you know, if you've done something like this, please make note on the bottom of the form because likely we're going to find it in all of our analysis. So we appreciate the honesty and integrity of the operators to let us know if something like that has occurred. And just to note, highlighting that, um, we do read everything. Uh, everything you write on the form gets transcribed over into the computer. Jeffrey gets the privilege of reading it. On final data review, Brian gets the privilege of reading all of your comments. Um, we do put our heads together occasionally. So um, short of right, filling that entire block in small print, you really can't provide us too much information. Um, if you feel like you've done something wrong at the site, uh, really just provide us comments. Brian and I talk about things. We always err on the side of allowing data. We don't like to invalidate data unnecessarily. If we feel it's a minor issue, we have various flagging. We can look at the chemistry of the site. Uh, there's handling errors we can look at or handling contamination um, that would not necessarily result in the samples being invalid. So really, uh, you're our partner here. You're our first eyes in the field uh, to report what's in the sample. And if you feel there's any way the sample's been compromised, make notes. It doesn't necessarily mean the sample will immediately be invalidated. Uh, just a, one or two things to highlight. The number one, um, generally a good rule is once water has left the bucket, short of pouring it in the bottle, it's gone. Yeah, if you're transported the bucket from the field and it leaked out, it spilled, it spilled into a tray, it's gone. Don't attempt to recover any of that because we know the chemistry is compromised. Another one is letting the sample thaw completely. The reason we do that is uh, samples will thaw regularly. Uh, we really need it to be completely thawed before you decant it. So we want to maintain the chemistry here as much as we can in our supplies. And let's move on unless there's any questions. Sample preparation is uh, as they're unpacked out of the boxes, uh, removed from the bottle, they're given a uh, the barcode that will uh, identify it with the sample number, uh, the barcode that also is put on at the time of receipt, and then this particular cart that has been filled uh, from a day of activity and shipments uh, will be moved on to our lab. Uh, coming up next, before we have, if we don't have any questions, uh, then we'll talk about how the sample proceeds through the lab. Are there any questions? All right, now this is where I turn, <laughs> turn it over to the authority. I, you know, I've, uh, I've covered about as much as I can now. I was going to see what you were going to say. Um, the first step, as Jeff said, the, the samples are prepared for the laboratory. The first thing we do is observe contamination. Uh, you've done that in the field, obviously. Um, we also have Angela Weddle, who's worked with our program a long time. She looks at every sample, so we have consistent observation across samples. She also pours the sample out and performs pH and conductivity analysis. And you're looking at her station here. Uh, the data go real time into our central database where it's verified and we, we run control charts. Those of you that have been in the program a real long time, uh, before 2004, you might recall you also ran chemistry at the field site, uh, pH and conductivity. Airmont stations still do that, of course. Uh, let's go on. After we measure pH and conductivity, this all NTN samples are filtered. Uh, and this is just a shot of Christina filtering one of our samples. We collect uh, one bottle that goes to the laboratory for analysis. And we also maintain a refrigerated archive if there's volume permitting. Uh, we keep that in the lab for five years. So if there's any question about the data, we can go back and reanalyze that sample. That's periodically, about once a year, we let you make you aware of archive samples available. After five years, we make those available to outside groups and other researchers. Just a note, um, there's a lot of special projects that go on with your samples. You may think it's just the acid rain and the nutrient studies, but uh, we've looked at fallout from the Fukushima nuclear disaster. We've, uh, I think we're coming off to the, the fourth year after that, it was 2011, and a number of special studies that utilize your sample. So uh, you're looking at the bottle on the right, your one liter bottle, and say, gosh, you're only using that little bottle on the left. 
there are actually behind the scenes, the NDP uh, funders support a number of special studies that, that do additional analyses. Go on, please. After filtration, we uh, load all the samples on a tray. Uh, we have about 100 or so on a tray, all labeled, and they uh, are waiting for analysis. And really, what I, the only point I'm emphasizing in this slide is to the analysts, they all look the same. Interspersed amongst these bottles are quality assurance samples that go blind to the analyst so that we can check our internal quality and consistency. We repeat analysis for about 2% of the samples. So this is very high-level QA data, and we purposely make them somewhat anonymous to the analyst. They just see a lab number. They don't know whose site it came from, who funded the site or anything, they, they just come through, uh, including replicates and, and quality assurance samples. Chris, I know that I get a question every now and then about uh, uh, the amount that should be poured and how much should be poured. Can you address that? Uh, we ask that you fill that one liter bottle if possible. In winter, we do recommend that you leave out a half to an inch at the top uh, for expansion should it freeze. It's not a bad idea to do on a general basis. Uh, we really use all that sample volume because we have to pre-rinse the filters for the samples. Um, should there be occasional spillage in the lab, we can go back to the original bottle if there was some issue in the filtration. We have had inquiries where people are trying to get away from that extra ounce of shipping. It really is, um, I, I realize everyone's budgets are tight, but limiting the amount of sample volume that you send to the lab doesn't really benefit the program as a whole because samples can leak. Um, you go to all that effort to collect that weekly sample. We really need as much as you can to ship to us. Um, yes, it looks like a very small sample bottle, but we pre-rinse our equipment as we're doing filtration. So please uh, fill that bottle. And if you have any concerns, feel free to call us. Now the minimum, the minimum amount to pour as well. The minimum amount to pour is anything. So if there's two drops of moisture in the bucket, uh, pour it. Uh, we can get PA. We do this about once a year. We should send an illustration. Um, just a couple drops in the bottom of the bucket is enough for us to do uh, an analysis. You'd be surprised. We can do a full analysis on as little as 10 mils. For operators as well, too, if you have a bucket that you put on a collector and it does have some residual uh, wash water, uh, we aren't able to dry the buckets before we ship them to you. So uh, carefully try to shake out any a residual water out of both the bucket and uh, the sample bottle. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, now we have some pictures in our laboratory. Um, as we talked about, this is uh, primarily the, the basis of the program is to look at acid rain and, and obviously the chemicals in our rain. We do our best to measure all the major ion species and I'll be listing them with the instrument that, that does the analysis. Um, and really, we do more than acid rain. We look at the full major ion analysis, which represents most of the chemicals in the rainfall. Uh, this first picture here is our flow injection colorimeter. Um, what you're seeing is left to right. The samples are stacked up in the rack to the left. They're injected into the uh, horizontal rectangular box to the right next to the computer screen, and they flow through. And this is to measure ammonium and orthophosphate ion, that's NH4 plus and PO4 3 minus on your reports. These are two nutrients that are of growing importance. We typically see high levels in the Midwestern United States, especially in agricultural areas. Um, a whole separate talk we could do would be trends in these species. Uh, this is where we're going to focus on the instruments today, but um, we've seen dramatic increases in these two uh, species over the last few years. Let's go on. This is our ion chromatograph where we measure the sulfate, nitrate, chloride, and bromide ions. That's SO4, NO3, Cl, and Br on your reports. We abbreviate them on the report because uh, so we can fit the columns in. But these are what we'd think of as the traditional acid rain species. So the sulfate and the nitrate come from the air pollutants coming from power plants and industry and vehicles. Uh, chloride can come from ocean sources. Bromide is a new analyte. We're, we're still um, evaluating it, but it, it's typically seen in ocean influenced areas. Uh, but this is uh, the ion chroma chromatograph and the ion chromatography analysis. Let's go on. 
And then this shot, uh, I, I like this. This is my favorite instrument. It's actually a, a new one we just received this year. It's an Agilent inductively coupled plasma spectrophotometer. And I went to the lab, and Katie Blades, who ran it, was, was down for the day. She kindly let me do some close-ups. So how this works is the plasma is a, a torch. It actually uses argon gas and glows. And you're seeing a close-up of that argon flame. It, it glows yellow, and Katie's injected some dye in there, so it shows up red, white, and blue with the yttrium standard. This measures calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. On your reports, that would be CA, MG, K, and NA. Um, and they actually glow. They, they don't glow to our eyes, but to the instrument, they give off a, a glow, which is in proportion to their concentration in the solution. Um, and that's actually how this instrument operates. Next slide, please. We've talked a lot about sample volumes. Uh, we just show here a processing analysis flow diagram. And the reason we're showing this is because these flags do appear on your report. We had some questions about uh, what we can measure. Um, the lowest volume is wet incomplete. It's actually a new protocol we've started in 2015. Uh, down to zero mils, just a couple drops, we can we prioritize the analysis. And then little as, as two or three mils, which is just maybe 20 or 30 drops of liquid, we can run the analysis. We generally prioritize them by their interest and the amount of sample we need to run the instrument. So you can see the analysis priority below that bottle um, we do the FIA, so that's your ammonium and orthophosphate, the IC, the ICP, and the last is pH conductivity. Uh, the middle column, we, um, when you have a little bit more volume, we dilute the sample down so we can do a full analysis as well as filter the sample. And then to the right, we can do a full analysis on anything over 30 milliliters. But the bottom line message is let us worry about the volume. You, if there's anything in that bucket, pour it in the bottle and we'll make the decision of how it's processed. So please, if there's anything in the bucket, pour it and ship it to us. And I can't emphasize that enough. Um, there's been times Brian and I wanted to cry because we've seen sample volume and there'll be a note on the field form that says, uh, too little sample to ship, so it was discarded. And we'll look and it was 20 or 30 mils. And I said, well, we could, we could get a full analysis on this. So it's really a, a wasted week of effort on your part not to ship that to us. Let's move on, please. Just some notes here, we're gonna show how we, at the end of this presentation, we're showing how we prepare and clean our supplies. This first shot, um, it's the equipment we use to purify the water. First, we use a reverse osmosis unit that's shown on the left that takes the, the softened city water and makes pure water. The picture on the right shows the holding tank and the deionizing tank. And the reason we're showing this is we often get questions is like, well, how come we can't wash our own supplies? Well, the reason is we have this whole setup to do in industrial level uh, quantities of very pure water. We're constantly testing it through our instruments. And we've shown that contaminated water in the cleaning can directly impact sample quality. So um, this is why we wash all the supplies for the program. We've done it since 1978. It's because we can maintain the quality of the source water that's used for cleaning. Next slide, please. This is where your buckets are washed. Uh, the two uh, silver boxes on the left are two industrial dishwashers that run eight hours a day, five days a week. We can wash eight buckets and lids at a time. Um, again, this is, ensures consistent quality across the network. We prepare all the supplies. NADP has always required this. We need to wash everything. You can see on the right the buckets and bottles being stacked up ready to wash. So we uh, use high purity water. Uh, and very, very clean things, maintaining clean and sample integrity through the process. Next slide, please. Supply shipping. Uh, your clean supplies are wrapped. We use high quality clean room grade bags to wrap everything, your buckets and your lids and your bottles. And this should be familiar to you. You get a large box of supplies from us that contains six weeks or six sets of supplies. You should have six collection buckets and lids, six of the one liter sample bottles, six shipping boxes, six of the field forms. Uh, if you're still operating the old strip chart Belfort recorder, you get six rain gauge charts and other supplies you may have requested. Just a couple notes. Um, it's hard to see at this scale, but there's a nice bright pink label. Uh, please complete that. That helps us keep your site supplied. Um, it lets us know the inventory you have and helps us to adjust supplies appropriate. You notice the little yellow uh, 
leaflet inside one of the buckets. We put a friendly note to you when you're getting low on supplies. That appears at your second to last bucket. As a reminder, if you haven't gotten a clean box of supplies, let us know uh, immediately when you see that. And we can, often things are lost in shipping, especially around the holidays. Um, and I, any other notes there? What do we do with return bags? Oh, what do we do with return bags? Um, what we do, we can't reuse them. We have actually our building maintenance staff using them for trash bags here at the water survey. We recycle as much as we can. Um, we have a, a number of road cleanup crews that use them. Um, unfortunately, we do have to discard them. We generate over 10,000 bags a year. So uh, we do reuse as many as we can, recycle as many as we can. Um, and you're free to I always hesitate here. If you have questions about how you might want to reuse the bag, let us know. We want the supplies wrapped when we, you return them to us. Um, you can put them together in one bag, but if you're planning on doing something like that, check with us because we want to check on a main one by one basis. We These aren't just common buckets. We acid leach them at the beginning and carefully wash them. So we like them wrapped because it prevents scratching from one bucket sitting in another because we do reuse them many years. So. Um, contact us if you have any questions about material reuse. There's also you do analysis on the bags as well. We do. We check all of this. This is a slide we'll see in a minute. Um, one more note you're going to start seeing soon. We've done some testing. Your one liter bottles, if you have extra ones, especially from dry weeks or any mismatched supplies, return them to us so they can be washed. Don't hold supplies at your site for long periods. Starting soon, we're going to actually be dating the one liter bottles um, so that you know we found that they're good for about a year at the site. Beyond that, we can't ensure the quality. So be looking for that in the near future. Again, if there's any questions, you don't, you know, you get to the site, you, you're you a backup operator, you don't know where things come from, uh, give us a call. We're happy to address any questions on a one by one basis. Ideally, we want to uh, maintain a, a 12 bucket, 12 bottle, and 12 lid, uh, two big boxes, inventory at each site i know that you'll get some uh you know when you got them in transit it's tough to tell and stuff like that going back and forth but like chris said though if you have an excess of the bottles the lids or anything like that uh please contact us we try to uh i know that spacing it can be an issue for some of the sites so uh you know the less that you have at your site that won't be in your way the more we can use for other sites that may be in need to build up their inventory so appreciate then, that yeah last note Keep your supplies in rotation. Use your oldest supplies first. Um, any extra Belfort charts, any extra bottles, return to us and we can reuse them. Let's go on. I'm putting like three used lids in one bag. Okay. Three used lids in one bag would be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you can reuse those Ziploc bags for something else. They are all food grade plastic. Uh, quality assurance, we've highlighted that. This is a picture of our quality assurance lab. It's Katie Blades who runs our ICP in the foreground, Lee Green who runs our ion chromatograph in the background. They're actually bottling up quality assurance solution. We uh, work with the World Meteorological Organization and we provide test solutions to lab year round or labs around the world. That allows our data to be directly compared to programs uh, throughout the world. Behind them, you'll see a stack of buckets and bags and lids and bottles. We pull randomly from the clean supplies and test them. We expose these to water. We test the water to ensure cleanliness. Again, this is why we clean all the supplies. If you had to do that at your site, you would have to be doing similar quality assurance. It's really very high level quality we do to ensure the cleanliness of all of our supplies uh, because we just need that for the, the long-term trends we're measuring. Uh, little bits of dirt, little bits of contamination will greatly affect the overall sample chemistry. Do's and don'ts. I think this is our next to last slide. Do you want to go through this, Jeffrey? Yeah, always keep a copy of your pink copy of your appeal form. Uh, reason for that is if there's a question in regards to something that was filled out on the field form and we need to contact you in reference to that particular thing, uh, then you know that you have a copy on hand, a hard copy. Yes, you have the electronic copy as well, but sometimes it's a good referral point. Uh, never put field form inside the bottle bag for the leakage reason. It can uh, melt the uh, melt the field form, uh, pour entire sample till one inch from the top. If you've got, uh, you know, more than that, uh, it's only necessary to send us one bottle and there again, leave about an inch from the top. If you have excess water, 
after you've decanted your sample, uh, I'll tell you it's pretty good for plants. Uh, you know, you can pour it and water your plants that way. You might be surprised how well they grow. Mm -hmm. uh, let debris settle, then pour into the bottle. Uh, if you can get around the bird droppings and the leaves and the dirt and stuff like that, uh, go ahead. We don't want you to shake it or try to get it to melt in any way or try to swirl it around to where it's on one side of the bucket and you pour from the other. If it just happens to go in there, that's something we want you to make note of. That kind of goes along with number five, never mix it up, shake it. Uh, never reach into the bucket to remove any debris. Uh, your hand should never even come close. Uh, that's why we supply gloves as one of the supplies on the fuel forms if you're running low on those. Uh, note too, when we're sending you back uh, supplies or sending you back the uh, new box of buckets and you've requested supplies, uh, always check the inside of that box. We uh, put memos in there. We put uh, supplies in there. So if you're asking for something, that's a good place to check. And if you ever have any questions, comments, or ever need anything, uh, use the uh, 800 number, 1-800-952-7353. You get to hear my friendly voice. So I'll try to get back with you as soon as possible via either a phone call or email. Uh, if it's something I can't answer right away, then I have plenty of people around me that help me in reference to things I'm not necessarily educated about, uh, but we are here for your uh, disposal. Next slide, please. Don't use a funnel. Don't use, yes, do not ever, do not, uh, general rule, do not ever use a supply we don't, that's not provided by Kale to provide, uh, to decant your sample. Yeah, never use a, a funnel. Uh, we have a separate webinar on sample processing that talks about weighing the bucket and decanting the sample. It highlights things like Jeffrey noted about uh, handling of any visible debris, but yeah, don't ever use a supply that has not been cleaned by Cal. And that's why it's real important in section five on your fuel form uh, to mark down uh, the amount of, or any sort of contaminants, uh, you know, in that section. Next. I think we have one last slide. Go ahead. There should be one. We obviously couldn't do this alone. This is our group photo from the CAL team. A uh, wonderful team that makes our lab successful. We have great people. So it's not just Jeffrey and me and, and Brian here. Brian's the tall one in the back standing next to the, <laughs> he's always off screen. So wonderful group in the lab. Uh, we've been at service to NADP since 1978 and uh, we're pleased to be here to support you. We couldn't do this without you. So thank you for all your efforts to collect the samples each week and respond to our questions. Uh, there's the contact information. Any last questions before we conclude? Well, thank you all this afternoon. With, uh, I'm Chris Lehman, Director of the Central Analytical Laboratory, Jeffrey Pribble. All the operators out there, again, we thank you for all you do to support our program.